How many of you are here? I mean, really, are you here? Yes, I know you are. Hey, you know what? If I, Let me ask this question. If you have been in church, just in church, at any period of time in your life, over one year, raise your hand. One year and above. Okay, everybody, keep them up. Come on, come on, don't be shy. Look around, see, there are others just like you, okay? Hey, I have to tell you, if you, yeah, yeah you can put them down, it's okay. Um, if you've been in church any period of time, you know this. <laughs> you may not know that you know this, but you know this. Oftentimes, when you're living the Christian life, something comes out that you really never intended to come out. And at just the wrong time. You know what I mean. It embarrasses you. It frustrates you. And you sometimes don't know what to do about it. And that's what the book of James is all about. The letter of James in the New Testament. It's just right after the big book of Hebrews. Near the end. Before the big book of Revelation. Okay, right in there. There's a letter written by the Apostle James. Now, he was a pastor. And I believe that he wrote this letter first and foremost to his church in Jerusalem. And then it got distributed all throughout the region of the world later on in the first century. But James, I believe, wrote this letter to help his church understand that living the Christian life can sound really great and it can appear to be really simple, but it is the most arduous endeavor Ever. Because just when we think we've got ourselves figured out spiritually, we do something really, really not good. And that's what our next series is about starting next Sunday. It's about inside out. It's all about what's in here. And sometimes what's in here, we don't want anyone else around us to know. And yet, it happens. So we hope that you'll join us by reading the book of James. Start this week, if you would. Uh, next Sunday, chapter 1, each succeeding Sunday. The next chapter, there are five chapters, so that kind of gives you an idea of how long the series is, okay? So I hope that you'll join us for Inside Out, because what's inside always, always, in some way, shape, or form, comes out and shows itself. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your wonderful gift to us. And Father, many of us in this room this morning have already experienced that marvelous gift. We possess it. If somebody were to ask us, we would uh, in some way, shape, or form say, yes, I am a follower of Jesus. But sometimes, Father, in following your son, Jesus Christ, our relationships sort of get muddied up. Sometimes they don't go the way we anticipate. And then when it comes to church, Father, your church, your son Jesus Christ established the church. And yet oftentimes when we walk into church, we are either disconnected or we feel at odd, at odds with others. Or sometimes, Father, we're, we're a little uppity. If I'm allowed to say that to you, Father, we're a little uppity. We look at others and we uh, compare ourselves and oftentimes we think we're pretty good. But Father, in your sight, all of us fall short. Except through the blood of your son Jesus Christ who gives us intimate standing with you as your children. Father, this morning as we look one final time at this thing called relationships, would it be that you would find me and everyone else in this room thinking about ourself and not looking at somebody else, not thinking about somebody else, but allowing your spirit to speak to our hearts? In Jesus' name, amen. So we have been in this series called God's Blueprint for Healthy Relationships. And down through the weeks, the pastors have worked to uh, help all of us to think about our relationships. And it's not about whether you're single or married. And it's not about whether you're a man or a woman. It's not about whether you're very young, like Adam, age 11, 
or if you are a little more esteemed in your age like I am, 66. Okay? There. For those of you who always wondered, now you know. Okay. It doesn't matter where we are in our life. What matters is how we are living out our relationships. And let's be honest. Sometimes relationships go south. They go bad. And oftentimes we look at ourselves and we wonder, how in the world did I end up like this? And yet in all of it, God's desire for you and for me is that our relationships would develop and grow. And so today we want to sort of end this series on this note. The most lasting relationships. Now you can debate this with me if you wish. Don't send me a text right now or send me an email right now. And those of you who are joining us via Facebook Live, you can respond. I won't see it until tomorrow, but you can respond to this. This is my personal opinion. Just want to clarify that before I tell you, okay? I believe that the most lasting relationships, the, the relationships that go into eternity are the relationships we develop within the family of God. I think these are the most significant relationships that we can have. Now, if you know anything about me, you know that I started church in the nursery. I went, to, I went to church in the nursery. I've been in church ever since. So that's 66 years of church. Okay? I've done church for 66 years. I've done it in a number of ways. I've been on your side of it, and now I'm on this side of it. Uh, when I say that, you know what I mean. I now have been serving professionally in church for 44 years. And through all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it, I have discovered, maybe you have discovered this too, that the most lasting relationships that I develop are ones that I develop with fellow believers who we go into it together. We're from all sorts of backgrounds and every one of us have our own little opinion about what church should and shouldn't be. But through it all, I'm telling you, my friend, I look so forward to eternity. And one of the reasons I do, not the main reason, but one of the reasons is I am going to celebrate with my brothers and sisters whom I have fellowshiped with, whom I have worked together with, over the many decades that I have been in church. Today, we live in a world where church is optional. It has become optional. Facebook Live. You get the privilege of zoning in on us, zooming in and seeing us wherever you are. There are people today who live around us who never, ever go to a church. They do church in their minds, on their own, separated from everyone else. But that's not what Jesus intended for us to do. Sometimes, and I've been there, by the way, those of you of the younger persuasion, I have been there where I thought, oh, brother, you mean, really, we got to do this again? Yes, I've been there. I've lived that. I've, I've been there when I've sat in church. I'll remember the time till I die that my dad had to get up out of his seat, walk down the aisle where my, friend, my best buddy ever, Mark Bennett. Mark and I were sitting in the second row right over here, but I'm not pointing at anyone, okay? Sat right there during a church service, and we were zoned out. Suddenly I felt a Big Daddy. So I've done it. I've done it. But the one thing I've learned is that serving Christ is the best thing ever if it's done in the context of Christ's church. I cannot obey Jesus better than to honor Him by being a part of His church. Now some people say, well, you know, I'm a part of the universal church. Well, great. 
Go visit with the universal church. Try to get a group together universally. See, I think that Jesus intended for us to establish his church wherever we are. And we are to come together and we're to fellowship together and we're to trust him and depend upon him and we're to disagree and debate and all of that. We mix it all in and it's the church of Jesus Christ that will stand against Satan, stand against hell, and never will it be defeated. I don't know if you ever check out news about churches in America. Thousands of churches close every year. You say, oh, that is impossible. No, really. They have, they have tracked them. It's out there. They, they see and collect information how churches die. And then there are churches all around who are dead, but that nobody has told them. And then there are churches like rest homes. And, and people go to them because they feel comfortable and they have their needs met. And that they get what they want, when they want, how they want, in the manner that they want it. But my friend, Jesus never intended for church to be something we do once a week and we find ourselves feeling obligated or we feel pressure or we'll disappoint the pastor if we don't show up. And my friend, I have discovered down through the years, it's not about me showing up. It's about me being a part of my Lord and Savior and coming together and realizing every week when I come here, I look around all of us and I think, wow, how awesome it is that God loves all of you like he loves me. And that he cares about you and you have a story and you have a, a life that is being lived for Jesus. And I do too. And we need to blend ourselves together. That's what this series is really about. God's blueprint. And my friend, whenever you follow the blueprint, you get it right. Now, I'm sure many of you are like I am. You buy something new, and it comes with instructions. Right? And you tell yourself, I don't need them. I can do this. I've got this. All I have to do is watch YouTube. Man, I can put this thing together. <laughs> yeah, I've done that so many times, it's ridiculous. Sheila finally says, David, just read it. David, just read it. David, just look at the instructions. No, 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 no. I've got it. I've got it. And then I end up going to our local home help places three, four times just to finally get it right. And you know, I think so many people in church are doing the same thing. Week in, week out. Trying to figure it out. Trying to check it out. Does this flavor fit me? Does this minister stroke me? Do they care about me? But this morning, I'd like for you to look with me at a letter, very just a couple of verses, found in a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a whole collection of churches in an entire region. And it's called the Book of Galatians. Galatia was an entire region. And within the region, there were a number of churches in the first century that had spawned from the church of Jerusalem. And as they were developing and growing, the Apostle Paul went to many of these cities, and he himself planted these churches. And then he left them for pastors to caretake. And then he would visit them, and he became concerned for them. And so he wrote this letter called Galatians. And in chapter 5, verse 13, near the end of the book, not completely, but getting close, he writes about a word that is very familiar to every person in this room. Okay, we even sung about it this morning. Here's what he wrote. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, or, and I've included the word, I like this word even better, 
commitment. Serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Turn to the person, just glance at them. Don't actually really let them know you're looking at them. Just go ahead and side glance. That's your neighbor. Okay, you got that? But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. The first thing that stands out to me is that relationships are forged as we share the ordeals of life. Listen, it's easy to have a relationship with another person as long as they agree with you. It's easy to have a relationship with another person as long as everything is good. You have fun together. You do cool things together. You watch the same TV shows. You go to the same movies. You even drink the same Diet Coke. Okay? It's easy. Having a relationship with another human being oftentimes is so easy as long as everything is nice, as long as everything goes well. Listen, those of you who happen to be in a marriage this morning, you understand this at a whole different level for you. It's fun to be married as long as you're married to the person who thinks like you, who will do what you want, who will meet your needs. Those of you who are single, you understand this. You understand that relationships are really cool when you hang with certain people who just are so agreeable with you, and they love to do what you do, and you just enjoy the vibe that you get. Okay, we all get it. But let me tell you something, my friend, something I've learned in church. Yes, I learned it in church. That when I put myself in relationship with other believers and we're forging and working hard together to do something for Jesus Christ, such as vacation Bible school. For some of you, that's old school. Well, get updated. Come, join our VBS. It is going to be so cool. I dare you. I dare you to meet me on June 11th at night. Right here. I can hardly wait. I look forward to it. No, not the pie in the face. But that's for another day. I've gone to therapy over that. Okay. So relationships are forged, okay? When you and I knit ourselves together. Listen. It is messy. I get that. Some people say, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything in church because all I'll do is get in bad with somebody and they'll disagree and they'll treat me poorly. <laughs> Relationships really deepen when we're walking with Jesus when we're going through stuff together. So let's go back and just look at these phrases. Here's the word, freedom. We sung about it. We're talking about it this morning. You and I are free. We are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. That's what he says. So what is this? Freedom is liberty from being bound to a system of living that leaves you with false hope and a horrendous eternity. Liberty. Liberty is freedom. To be who Jesus calls me to be. I have the freedom in Christ to walk with Him, to not be weighted down by a bunch of rules, legalistic regulations, and other people's opinions. I have the freedom to celebrate life in my life each day. And I think there are so many people who go to church week in and week out who don't seem to experience. I don't know. I'm not judging anybody, but I'm just observing. I think there are a lot of people who go to church who are not really enjoying their liberty in Jesus Christ. Okay? But the word freedom literally means liberty. The constraints are broken off the chains are released, and I get to be the person Jesus wants me to be. 
I am 66 years of age, and I am still in process. I have not arrived. I still have stuff to do, things to learn. You know how I know that? Because I woke up this morning. And so did you. But there are some who think they've arrived. They think they've got it all figured out. You may be one of those. Secretly, inside, no one would know this about you, but inside you probably think to yourself, you know what, I'm okay. Oh, man. When we truly live in liberty, it's amazing what God can do in the life of a church. So he goes on to write, for you were called to what? Freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. See, God is so thorough. He explains freedom, but then he makes it very clear what freedom isn't. Freedom is not liberty to live my life the way I want to, to please myself, to be who I want to be. See, the big difference is in freedom with Christ, I get the free choice, the liberty to be the individual. Jesus, my Savior, died on the cross to make me into. That's true freedom. That's not faking it. That's not giving lip service to Jesus on Sunday morning. And then the rest of the time, I get to make my own choices. I get to do my own thing. I get to express myself the way I want to be. Listen, listen, those of you who are of younger age, I cannot impress on you enough. I know I'm an old guy. Okay, I get it. I wear socks. But I'm telling you, there was a day when I thought, I've got this figured out. I could play the game on Sunday. I could stand up in church with my three buddies and sing our hearts out gospel music in our church. I was part of a quartet when I was in high school. We thought we were pretty cool. We were the creme de la creme of our youth group. Yeah. Away from church, nobody knew that I was a follower of Jesus. Not because of what I did, but because of what I didn't do. So often we think if people are doing bad stuff, they're, 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 they're faking it. Listen, I think there are a lot of fakes in church every week, all over the world. Individuals who go to church and fake it. And then the rest of the time, they try hard not to express it. Freedom is to honor Jesus, even in the congregation where I'm a part of. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, commitment, serve one another. For, where, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love, you shall be committed to, you shall give your life to that of your neighbor. Those people that you call friends and co-worshippers. And, and many of you have linked up with New Hope. You have made a commitment to one another in membership. Listen, my friend, it's more than a label. It's an attitude of the heart. And that's what the Apostle Paul was trying to explain to these churches. They were all young churches in the first century. They were still trying to figure themselves. Some of them, many of them were Jews. They had come out of the Jewish religion, which had been dead for over 400 years. And now they had brand new life. And the Apostle Paul says, listen, in this new life, you've got the opportunity to make a difference. I remember a man that I sat under when I was in junior high school. His name was Tom Beaver. He was a paraplegic. Tom was a husky guy, muscular, but he couldn't walk. 
But the thing I remember, I do not remember one thing Tom Beaver ever taught in Sunday school. I do remember the connection Tom made with myself and other boys. And it changed me. It confirmed for me that even if you are physically disabled, you can live a life of vibrancy for Jesus. You know where I learned that? In junior high Sunday school on Sunday mornings and then outside of the classroom just having Tom a part of my life. Some of you understand what I'm talking about. You have had individuals in church that have changed your heart, encouraged your life, who have fed into you. I can hardly wait until I get to heaven. I'm looking forward to connecting with Tom Beaver, who will be walking and celebrating the streets of heaven. And I can hardly wait. Don't you want that? I mean, really, down inside, don't you look forward to celebrating with believers that you have shared the load with down through the years? That's what he's talking about. Our freedom is an opportunity for selfless service. A lot of people think church is for me to come and sit for an hour and have others do for me. And that's not what Jesus taught us about church. Church is coming together, building up one another, and going out and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the world around us. You know, my friend, Jesus never called me to be a world partner in another part of this world. He called me, and I know it to the core of my life, I even chose a verse many years ago that represents it. It's a verse found several chapters later in the, in the book, or earlier in the book of, of Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it isn't me that lives. The life I now live, I live by the faith I have in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My friend, that is my clarion call. Jesus didn't call me to be anything else. He called me to care for people, to be a pastor. And it's not about whether everybody thinks it's the right thing for me or not. It's the thing that I know before God that if I don't do it, I'm going to shrivel up. Do you know what God has called you to? Do you know how God has gifted you? In another letter that the Apostle Paul wrote, he talks about church ministry. Church ministry. Church ministry improves when you and I decide that God wants us to be a part of the solution rather than being the problem. So often in church. I watched this from a young age. I watched it from sitting out there with my parents and with the youth group and everything else. I observed how some people treated other people at church. I listened to some people who grumbled and complained all the time about church. I watched my own dad not go to uh, Sunday school on Sunday mornings because he got mad at somebody. He would drop us three kids off every Sunday morning. And then he'd show up for church with my mom. He never went back to Sunday school because he got bent out of shape. I've seen it all, my friend, like many of you have. But here's the solution. The Apostle Paul writes these words to one church in particular. A fabulous church of of the first century. Corinth. Okay? And he wrote to them about this very issue. Here's what he wrote in chapter 12. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Here they are. Three things God gives to you. Every person in this room, including Pastor Dave, we all have a spiritual gift. You, my friend, you're a follower of Jesus. He has planted something inside of you that you can only do through His power. Are you doing it? This is why we're offering connections 
class number three. Collect, connection classes number three is all about discovering and thinking about the unique gift God has planted into you. And it also includes the activities, the natural skills and talents that you have been born with, I've been born with, that we can use to make a difference for Jesus Christ in the context of the local church. I encourage you, my friend. Some of you have been in this church for 20 years plus. I, I encourage you to go to these one-time simple classes. You say, class, I don't want to go to a class. Then think of it as a group. Think of it as an opportunity to get refreshed, to think about you in relationship to the rest of us. Every month, these, these opportunities are being made available every month. And I hope that you'll take advantage of it. In fact, why don't you think right now to yourself, you know, before 2018 is out, before it ends, I'm going to attend every one of those. From one to four. I'm just going to do it. Why? So that I can be better informed on how to build the family of God. Right here. Listen, folks, we're here. We're not somewhere else. Now, you have the freedom to go wherever you want. I can't keep you here. I get that. But we bend together. Jesus calls us to be effective. So the second thing is your natural skills and talents. Everybody in this room has a natural skill or talent. You just may not have discovered it yet. And you say to yourself, well, good night. I'm 52 years old and I don't know what my skill is. Well, come to the group. We'll tell you what it is. <laughs> yeah, some of you totally missed that. That's okay. Service, number three opportunities. Did you know coming up in June is the biggest kids event we have every year at New Hope? Did you know that? It's the biggest event. Four days of fabulous interaction with kids. I love kids. They drive me nuts, but I love them. I love rubbing shoulders with them. And for, for four days, I get to wear shorts to church. I just, I think that is so cool. Okay, so if you want to come and get scared, you join me and be a part of that. Listen, serving. We have people who can serve all over this place. There are all sorts of things you can do. In fact, we even have a board out here in the hallway that seems to be left behind, but it's still there. You can actually sign up for one thing one time. You don't have to make a commitment for the rest of your life. You can do one thing one time. I dare you to go out there and check it out. In fact, in the lobby today, we have opportunities. Listen, my friend, I have to share my gift. If I don't, I shrivel up to ineffectiveness for Jesus. And my friend, every person in this room who's a follower of Jesus, if you are not allowing yourself to be used by Jesus, you're shriveling up and you don't even know it. You say, well, I really don't like to hang with those people. Listen, listen. They probably don't want to hang with you either. But they'll let you join forces. It's great. Why do I say all this? Because now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all. To each is given the expression of the Spirit for the common good. We need you. You need us. We need each other. That's how Jesus designed his church. We didn't make this up. The pastors didn't sit in a room and say, hey, let's, let's make this up. No. Jesus has us covered. All these are empowered by the one and same Spirit. All are empowered. Jesus Christ this morning invites you and me to use our abilities we have been given to strengthen his church. Listen, my friend, 
as you and I choose to honor God, as you and I choose to be free before the Lord and to invest, this congregation here, we are a part of Christ's church, but this congregation here will become stronger, more effective. Are you willing? Maybe you're here this morning and this Jesus thing is foreign to you. Or maybe you've sat in church a lot and you've heard about Jesus, but you are still holding on to yourself. I'm telling you, my friend, please don't hold on to yourself anymore. I discovered that when I gave Jesus Christ my life, it changed everything in my mind, in my heart. When I finally repented before Jesus, and by the way, that's what it takes. You know what the word repentance means? It means to make a decision to go in a different direction. If I confess my sins and acknowledge that Jesus Christ died on the cross and was buried and spilled His blood for my sins, and I allow Him to wash my sins away, I become the follower of Jesus. Have you ever done that? In a few moments, you're going to have that opportunity. But let me speak to you who are family. Are you expressing what Jesus has given to you? If you are, don't quit. If you never have, Now's the time to get started. Or maybe you've done it in the past and you think that you have uh, achieved retirement age. You better hope not because you're not going to be here much longer. See, a lot of people think there comes a point in my life where I can no longer do what God invested in me to do. No, my friend. There's not a retirement age with God. Are you fully in with Jesus. In a moment, Pastor Chris is going to come with the team. going to sing a song. What about you? Chris, 